Hello everyone. In this episode I'd like to talk about query strings. Query strings are actually a part of URLs. If we take a interesting variety of URL that uh, is similar to things that you may have actually seen on the web, what we actually have here in this URL at the very beginning of course is the protocol. That's then followed by the service and the domain name. Some URLs stop there, but ones that are a little bit more interesting might also th then contain a path. Following the path, the most interesting URLs then contain what we're talking about in this episode, which is called a query string. The query string itself is separated from the rest of the URL by a question mark, so you'll always see that there preceding a query string when a query string is present. If we look at just the query string itself, what we find is that it is actually made up of what are called URL parameters. Query strings can contain one or more URL parameters. This one, for example, has two. And each URL parameter, if there is more than one, will be separated from the others with an ampersand symbol. The actual URL parameters themselves, then, are made up of two different parts. The first part is the name, and the second part is the value that's being assigned to that name. The name and the value, of course, have an equal sign between them, so what we end up with there in a URL parameter is something that looks very much like a variable assignment in JavaScript. So what's the point in these uh, URL parameters and these query strings? What are they for? Well, the way the web actually works is that the web is actually what is referred to as a stateless system. By stateless, we mean that it doesn't maintain state. And by saying that it doesn't maintain state, basically what we're saying is that the web has no memory. For example, if we have a client computer, which is what I have here on the left, and a server, which is what I've got on the right, whenever the client is surfing the web, what they're actually doing is submitting what are called GET requests to a server. Each one of these GET requests has a URL in it, like we were talking about before, and the URL basically is asking the server, would you please send me some particular page? Whenever the server receives one of these GET requests from a client, assuming that it actually has the page that's been asked for, the server then takes that page and returns it back to the client again, where of course then the client's browser renders the HTML and executes any JavaScript that's included in it. So here we had the client request a page called index.html and the server has then returned that page. The client might then turn around and click on a link on the page that it was uh, given from the server. Uh, whenever you click a link, it does the exact same thing as if you actually type in a URL by hand. It basically forms a GET request. That GET request is sent to the server. The server looks for the page that's being asked for. In this case, the page is called gallery.html. If it has that page, it then takes that page and returns it back to the client again. Now this is where the statelessness comes in. What we have here at this point is we have a client that's requested two pages, the index page and the gallery page. And as far as the server is concerned, it makes absolutely no difference that the client requested index before gallery because it's stateless. It maintains no memory. So from the server's point of view, it doesn't matter whether it was a client that requested index and then a different client that requested gallery, or whether it was the same client that requested both, the server doesn't care. It just returns whatever pages are asked for and doesn't make any kind of correlation between one page being uh, uh, requested and then another page being requested again after that. Where this can uh, get kind of complicated or where this becomes sort of uh, important, I guess you could say, would be, let's say for example that we have a small website where we uh, are selling items from a store. So we have a store page that lists out the different items that are being sold. But maybe this website also allows users to uh, enter a coupon code, some kind of promo code, which then gives them some sort of discount on items in the store. Now, of course, the client could just request the store page and start looking at uh, products that are in the store, go through the process of adding them to a cart and buying them, all of that good sort of stuff. Or, of course, the client could go to the coupon page, enter a coupon number, and then from the coupon page proceed to the store, where they would then expect to see discounted prices based on the coupon that they entered. The trick here would be, though, if the client first goes to the coupon page and then goes to the store page, how does the store page or the server serving the store page know that they had gone to the coupon page first? Since the web is stateless, it has no way of really correlating or remembering that one page was visited before another. That's where our URL parameters come in. 
and the query strings. If when they go to the coupon page and are then redirected to the store page, if a query string is included at that point, then that would be an extra piece of information in the URL that would tell the server when it gave the store page, when it served the store page, that the coupon page had already been visited and discounted prices should be listed. Now there's a million and one different ways that these query strings can be used for a million and one different uh, different things that you might want to do on a website. But let's go ahead and go now and look and see how JavaScript actually accesses and uses these query strings. To access query strings in JavaScript, what we actually need to do is we need to work with a sub-object that's located inside the doc document object called the location object. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to put a set of script tags here inside the body tags and inside them I'm just simply in this example going to do a document.write line and what I'm going to print out is the value that's located in document.location.search. If I come back over to my browser at that point and take a look, you can see right now that document.write line is not actually producing any values. But if I come up and I actually by hand modify my URL and include a query string in it by putting in a question mark followed by a URL parameter, I'll put in test1 equals 1, and then I hit enter to reload the page, you can see that what JavaScript actually does is it takes whatever query string value is available in the URL, starting with and including the question mark and everything following it, and it automatically puts that value into document.location.search, making it available to me there in JavaScript. If I wanted to include a second URL parameter, I could follow the first one with an ampersand, put in a second parameter, I'll put in test2 equals 2, and again when I reload the page you can see that everything from and including the question mark is automatically put into that search attribute for me and is made available. So JavaScript has pretty quick and easy access to the query string simply by using document.location.search. The only real downside to document.location.search is it simply includes the raw query string, the question mark and everything following it. So just about any time that we need to deal with variable numbers of URL parameters or multiple URL parameters that could be in different orders, we're going to have to actually take this query string and we're going to have to parse it, more or less break it up into a more manageable format so that we can access the values in it that we actually want. So JavaScript makes accessing the query string very easy. So now let's go and take a look at some examples of how we can actually generate query strings since we can't reasonably expect the user to come up and modify the URL on their own. To show you one of the ways that we can make query strings available to our JavaScript code, what I've actually done here is I've put together a, a quick little page for us. Uh, this is what it actually looks like rendered in the browser. I have three links that I've placed up here in the upper right hand corner for small, medium, and large, and in the body here I basically just have three paragraphs of text. What I'd actually like to do is I'd like to set this up so that clicking these links actually reloads this page or calls this page again, links to this page again, and passes the page a uh, query string indicating what size text we'd want. Uh, we could, for example, say that the default text size that we see right now is medium. So when I click on the small link, I actually want it to come back and have everything on the page be smaller. When I click the large link, I want it to come back and have everything on the page be larger. So what I actually have for the code in this page right now is of course a regular HTML document. Inside uh, the head section I have put in some embedded CSS. Most of it's just to make it look a little bit decent, but a few things that I'd like to point out is that I do have a, a page element. It's actually a div down inside the body. Um, everything else inside the page, everything on the document is actually there inside the page div. So on the page div what I've actually done is I've set a default font size of 12, 12 pixels. Um, besides that, everything else in here is fairly normal. Here are the actual links that I've put in and you can see that each one of the three links right now is just linking back to this page. This page's name is font size changer and that's where each one of those three links goes. And besides that there's really not much of interest here, just paragraphs of text and a little bit of stuff down in a footer just to make it look more like a real page I guess. If I wanted to set this up then to use query strings to let me actually change the size of the text, where I might start off is by actually hard coding in some query string values into the actual links themselves. 
Like I said before, I want to have the medium link be basically the default size, so I'm going to leave it just the way it is. But whenever the user clicks on the small link, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hard code in here a query string where I set a size parameter equal to small. And down here for the large link, I'm going to put in a query string or a, a URL parameter where I set a, a size URL parameter to large. So whenever those two links are clicked, those values will actually be given back to this page when the page is reloaded. If we actually come back over to the browser now, you'll notice that when I click, well, let's start here. From the way the page is right now, if you take a look up at the address, you'll notice that there's no URL parameters at all, no query string. If I click on small, this page reloads because we basically just made a new request for it and this time when we requested it, it included the URL parameter size equals small that I included in that small link. When I click on the large link, again this page is requested and in the request it includes size equals large as a URL parameter. And if I go back to medium, the URL parameter is gone again because I didn't hard code in any query string to go along with that particular link. So what I would need to do next then is I would need to write some JavaScript that was sort of aware of the different parameters that could become available and to uh, actually change the font size of my page element based on which of the different parameters it sees. So what I'm going to do is up here in the head section I'm going to put in a set of script tags and um, these URL parameters are actually available uh, immediately as soon as the page is received. So if we were working with URL parameters by themselves we could uh, skip over the step that we've been doing recently of doing a window.onload event. But since what we're actually going to end up doing in the long run is not only detecting the parameters but then also changing HTML attributes um, uh, based on what parameters we receive, I am going to go ahead and keep everything here inside a window.onload event handler like we've been doing recently. So here I'm going to basically say that as soon as the document's loaded, right, I'm going to say if the value of document.location.search if it's equal to question mark size equals small, oops, got an extra quote in there, all right, so I'm basically saying if this is the URL parameter that is received, then what I want it to actually do is I want it to change the size of the page element. So I'm going to start off by retrieving the page element by doing a get element by ID, retrieving the thing called page, right? and then for that page element I'm going to change its uh, font size CSS style. So I need page.style.fontsize and I'm going to, for the small size, maybe set it to 8 pixels. That should be a noticeable change. So let me jump back over to my browser and hit refresh. And if I come up and click the small link now, you can see that it works just fine. When the page was reloaded, after it was, while it was being passed the small equal, uh, size equals small parameter, my JavaScript recognized that the parameter, the query string that was passed, was size equals small, and as a result retrieved the page element and changed the font size, the basic font size of everything, so everything got smaller. If I click on the medium link now, okay, because the JavaScript didn't receive size equals small, it went ahead and just stuck with whatever the default size was. So if we wanted to make our large link also work, we could more or less just copy what we already have here. And instead of looking for size equals small, we could look for size equals large instead. And then maybe we could change the default font size to 14 pixels instead of the default 12. Again, back over to the browser and reload. My small works, my medium works, and my large works. So I'm able to change to those three different sizes of text here on this page by using, in this case, URL parameters, by using query strings. Even though this particular example works just fine, I'm not really crazy about the way that it's actually put together. One of the first and foremost things that bugs me about it is sort of the connection that exists between the URL parameters that are written inside the HTML and the actual strings that we're testing for up here inside the um, JavaScript section. Um, can, uh, take for example, what if I wanted to add a fourth size called extra large? I would need to add a new link in the HTML and then I would need to make sure that in the JavaScript I tested for the same uh, query string that was put together in the HTML. There's an awful lot of reliance uh, on the HTML uh, as far as the JavaScript is concerned. 
what I think I might like better would be something a little bit more generic where down here in the HTML instead of specifying generic sizes like small medium and large where maybe I actually go through and I put in an actual value something like this where I set the size specifically to 8 or the size specifically to 14 what I could then do is in the JavaScript instead of having to go through and test for all the different possible words um, that represent different sizes what I could do instead is I could take the query string and I could actually parse it down break it down into its pieces and from that then uh, pull out the actual size value if it exists and assign that directly to the CSS for the page element so up here inside my um, uh, JavaScript let me just um, pretty much take out everything that I have there now except for the window.onload function. What I'm going to do instead is I'm going to go through a series of steps here where I actually want to parse or break down whatever query string might be received. I'm going to start off first of all by putting in an if statement where I just want to see if there is a query string at all. So I'm going to check to see if document.location.search is uh, not equal to blank so as long as there is something up there then I'm gonna take whatever is there and I'm gonna start breaking it down the first thing I might do in breaking it down is to get rid of the actual question mark that's up there at the beginning of it the question mark I kinda of wish JavaScript didn't include at all because it's really fairly meaningless if there is a query string it will start with a question mark there's no doubt about it so it'd be nice if they just kind of left it off so, uh, but it doesn't. JavaScript does include it. So the first step I might want to go through is to actually get rid of it. So I'm going to make myself a new variable. I'm going to call it QS for query string. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a, a substring on document dot location dot search dot substring because what I want to do is I want to extract from document.location.search extract from the substring basically everything except the question mark so for the substring I'm going to tell it to start at character 1 uh, the question mark itself would be character 0 remember the way that uh, the different characters in a string are numbered off is very much like an array where they always start off at 0 so I'm going to tell my substring to start at character 1 which means we're going to skip over the question mark and then I'm going to take everything out of it up to document.location.search.length so basically everything else that's there maybe I'll go ahead and throw in an alert and look at the value of QS just so we can see what we get at that point come back over to my browser and click one of my links and you can see I have my query string but the question mark is gone so that first step uh, of uh, breaking down the string was successful we were able to at that point get rid of the question mark which is the first thing we need to do the next thing I would want to do then is I would want to actually take the name and the value of that URL parameter and I'd want to separate them from one another so I'd like to have size separate from 8 the way I could do that would be pretty easily uh, doing that could be pretty easily done by using the split function you might remember that the split function takes a delimiter in this case I'm going to tell it my delimiter is an equal sign and what the split function then will actually do is take the string that it's given QS uh, size equals 8 for example and will split it apart and leave out the equal sign using the equal sign is the thing that tells it where to actually do the split that will then return to me a uh, array which I'm going to call a uh, pair and that uh, pair array will have in its first element everything that was before the equal sign and it'll have in its second element everything that's after the equal sign so once that split is done okay, uh, well just to test it out we could go ahead and print out pair here just to see what we get there you see I get size in the zeroth element and eight in the one element I could then do something like say if uh, pair element zero is equal to size then I know that I have a size parameter there and if I have a size parameter there that means the next value element one of the pair array is the actual size that I want so that's the point where I could then actually go and retrieve my page element get element by ID for page there we go and then I could change its size uh, when I go to change its font size I could do it by doing page .style .font size. and instead of hard coding in a value here this time what I could do is I could take the value from uh, pair element one 
I could append pixels onto the end of it, and then I'll be able to have more uh, easily changed sort of dynamic sizes. Let's see how that works. Oop, sure enough, it worked right off the bat. We're at the small size now. If I go back to medium, that's still fine. In the case of medium, there was no parameter. So what happened is right up here on the very first statement where we checked to see if the location.search was blank, the answer was yes, it is blank. So we didn't do any of our other code here. If I go up to large, sure enough, it works. So I like that technique a little bit better. Uh, from kind of a programming standpoint, I suppose it's a little bit more complicated, but I think it actually shortened our uh, code a little bit. And I certainly like the, uh, the fact that I can now just simply and easily change things down here in my HTML and not have to tinker with the JavaScript any anytime I want to make a change. Maybe, for example, I decide that I decide that the small size of 8 is too small. I could just change it to 9 there in the HTML and there it's not quite as small as it was before. Or maybe I decide the large size of 14 isn't large enough, so I change it to 24. If I switch over to large, you can see that it's considerably larger at that point. So anytime I want to make a change to any of my sizes at this point, all I have to do is make that change in the HTML. I don't have to go back and monkey with the JavaScript. This JavaScript could even be something that at this point maybe I would take and put into an external file so that I could quickly and easily be able to reuse it on multiple pages on multiple different projects. Since there's really nothing here in the JavaScript itself that's dependent on um, this particular page, that should be something that we could do fairly easily. As another example of a place where um, URL parameters and query strings could potentially come in handy for us, what I was thinking about doing here was an example of uh, putting together a photo gallery. A uh, photo gallery is probably something pretty common, something that you've run into on the internet probably many times. But uh, if you ever actually think about how to put a photo gallery together, it could potentially end up being a lot of work. More or less what the idea here would be with our photo gallery is that we would want to have a page that had uh, thumbnails of all of the different images in our gallery available. We'd want the user to be able to click on a thumbnail to then go to another page where they could then look at a, uh, a higher resolution, a larger copy of that particular image. Now if we were to do this with just HTML, what we would end up with is as many individual pages as there are images in the photo gallery plus one for the actual thumbnail page. So if, for example, we had uh, 10 images in our gallery, then we would have to have the thumbnail page plus an individual page for each of those 10 images to show the higher resolution copy of it. If we had a million images in our gallery, then we would have to have a million and one pages. Pretty unmanageable. But what we could actually do here using uh, URL parameters is we could actually put together a site that would let us have any number of images in it and never have to create more than just two HTML pages for it, which means that our maintenance, uh, our uh, upkeep of the site would be much, much simpler. Anytime we need to do uh, fixes or uh, changes to the site, we would only have two pages we'd really have to worry about. So what I've actually done here is I have created two pages. One of them is called Photo Gallery Index and the other one is called Photo Gallery View. Basically what the ideal will be is that our Photo Gallery Index page will have on it uh, all of the actual thumbnails and I think I'll probably end up actually putting those thumbnails in with JavaScript instead of writing the HTML myself. Anytime one of those thumbnails is clicked on, what I'm then going to want to do is have a URL parameter passed over to the photo gallery view page where I'll then on that page have some JavaScript code that will look at what the parameter is and based on that decide which image that's actually supposed to be shown there. So essentially we'll have one page with thumbnails and another page that's capable of showing any of the larger copies of the images. That's how we're actually going to get away with just two pages. Now uh, to some raw material that goes into this. I actually have here some images that I gathered up. Uh, there are four images of bridges and what I actually have is I have a bridge one thumbnail. You can see how the name is put together and then the actual image that goes with that that's the larger copy is just called bridge one. There's a bridge two thumbnail and then the larger resolution copy is just called bridge two. So you can kind of see how I've put the file names together there. And what I'll be able to do in my JavaScript is basically just refer to these images by their name, bridge one, bridge two, and then depending on where the JavaScript is doing its work on the index page or on the view page, it will decide whether to actually show the thumbnail or not. And they're all JPEG images so I can have the JavaScript throw that in there all by itself. Now, to get started, I think what I'm going to do is down here in the body, I'm going to put in a div 
and I'm going to give that ID, uh, that div an ID of uh, maybe thumb holder. And then inside that actual thumb holder div that I'm going to have some JavaScript go through and actually create all of the actual thumbnail images for me. So up here in the head section then, set a script tags. And in the script tags, I'm going to have some JavaScript that I want to run after the page is loaded. So I'm going to put all this into a window.onload function. There we go. And what I'm essentially going to want this thing to do is to go through a list of all the different images that should be displayed and to automatically build all of the HTML code that's necessary and to stick it down there into the thumb holder div. The question that, that first question that we run into then though becomes where does it get, get the list of images? Well, probably what I want to do is uh, in some variables actually store information about the different images that are available to be viewed. Uh, each one of those different images then um, uh, will have some information stored about it in these variables and it'll not only need to be available here to our index page where the thumbnails are but that list will also need to be available uh, to our um, uh, our view page. So I think what I probably ought to do here is create another file, uh, an external JavaScript file. So let me go ahead and start up this new file. I'm going to save it as, um, let's say, uh, photos.js, I suppose is what I'll call it. And essentially what I'm going to do over here then is, um, is uh, put together some kind of data structure that will actually have all the necessary information about the images stored in it. So let me start with a comment here. Uh, this is the photo information for the photo gallery example. All right, now what information do I actually want to store about the photos? Certainly I'm going to need to store their names. Is there going to be anything else? Uh, maybe a description, uh, maybe a title, something along those lines. Since there might be more than one piece of information that I want to store about each individual image besides just the image's name, I think maybe an object would be the best way to put this kind of thing together. So I think what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to start by creating an array. I'm going to call it the photos array. I'm going to say this is a new array. There we go. And then what I'll do is into the photos array, into each element of it, or maybe I'll just use the push method, make things a little bit easier. I'm going to put in a, um, an object literal here that basically describes an image. So let's start off with the uh, image's name. Let's see, the first image's name would be uh, bridge one which needs to be spelled correctly or nothing's going to work. Let's say that particular image's uh, title will be, let's see, what is bridge one? Bridge one is I-44 actually. There we go. And let's say that it's going to have a description. And the description will be uh, taken uh, beneath the I-44 overpass, something like that. All right. I need to go ahead and put in um, basically these same sort of statements for my other four images. So let me do that here real quick. There we go. I think I have all the correct information filled in about the four different images that I've supplied. Now, this uh, file that contains these uh, contains the information about these different images is going to need to be available. So what I'm going to do is back over here in my uh, index page, I'm going to put in a, a script tag, a set of script tags with the source attribute so that I can import that external file, which I called a photos.js, right? Yes, photos.js. And that same list of information is also going to need to be available to me over on my view page. So I'm going to go ahead and jump over to the view page now and go ahead and just copy that in there. Uh, we're going to need it here in just a little bit. All right, with that information available, that then gives me my list, will provide to me my list of images that needs to be displayed down below in my thumb holder div. So what I'm going to do down here is I'm going to start by retrieving that thumb holder div. Uh, I'm going to say uh, var holder equals document dot get element by ID. Thumb holder. Kind of sounds painful, doesn't it? Something that will hold your thumb. 
I don't guess it has to be. Uh, one way or another, <laughs> there I've retrieved my thumb holder div. Uh, what I'll need to do next then is probably run through a loop that'll basically go through and construct the actual image tags and the anchor tags and add them to that thumb holder div so that I end up with a good uh, a set of working HTML in there. So uh, my, I have my array of uh, photos which is over here in my external file called photos so what I'm gonna do here is I think maybe I'll put together a for loop I'll say uh, for a variable X that starts at 0 basically meaning the beginning of the array as long as X is less than photos dot length the length of the array then keep incrementing X and then each pass through this loop I'm gonna want to go through the steps that are necessary to actually put the um, the uh, image down there into the uh, thumb holder div. So let's see, I'm going to need uh, anchor tags with image tags inside of them. So let me start by creating the actual image tags. I'm going to say var uh, image equals document dot create uh, create element uh, create element. That's what I need. I was thinking there was something else that needed to go on there, but create element should do it. Uh, create element IMG, so an image tag is what's being created. That image tag is going to need a source attribute, and the source attribute on this page will basically be the thumb version of the image. So I'm going to go to my photos array element X, and from that object that will be stored there I'm going to extract the images name and then I'm going to append to it underscore thumb dot jpg so that should give me a good source attribute the next thing I'll need then is an actual anchor tag so for the anchor tag I'm gonna do var uh, uh, I'll just call it a I suppose since it's an a tag we're creating document dot create element tell it I want to create an a tag a hyperlink this a tag is going to of course need an href attribute the href attribute is going to be need to be a link over to my other page uh, photo gallery view dot html and then I'm also going to need to append to that a URL parameter where I tell that page which image it's supposed to display so I'm going to put a new new URL parameter in here that has the name image and for the image parameter I'm going to give it the actual name of the image so just like I did before I'm going to do photo element x dot uh, name there we go hopefully that'll give us a good hyperlink now let's go ahead and snap those two parts together the image goes inside the hyperlink so I'm going to do a dot append child and I'm going to append the image in there so the image becomes a child element of the anchor tag and then the anchor tag needs to go inside the holder so holder dot append child uh, a there we go let's jump over to the browser and see what happens oops not much of anything it doesn't look like let's check out our development tools and see what went wrong can't find variable photo on line 20 right there that should be photos let's try that hey there we go now we're getting somewhere uh, it tried as you can see to display my four images but they didn't actually show up the way you would hope that they would right if I actually look at the code that was generated inside thumb holder here you can see I have four anchor tags and it looks like the hrefs were put together pretty well and inside each one of those anchor tags I have an image tag and it looks like the image tag is put together well the problem is that uh, my actual images are inside a uh, subfolder which I forgot to include here so here before the image name I'm gonna put in images slash and append that to the front of the image name uh, for my actual image tag so I take a look at it now and there we go there are my four thumbnails each one of them should be clickable a little bit of CSS in there to clean it up and spread them apart a little bit would be nice but is hardly crucial at this point that's an easy thing that can come back and be done later so we've got our first page where our JavaScript is actually putting together our thumbnail views of our photo gallery for us. What we would need to do next then is set it up so that when we actually click on one of these images and it takes us over to the uh, view page, it passes it the image attribute and the name of the image that should be displayed here. We just need to put some code onto this page so that it actually will display it.
Uh, maybe what we'll do is uh, actually put in a few different things down here. Let me start by putting in a set of H2 tags, which I'm going to give the ID of title. I'm going to leave them blank for right now. Uh, let me also then down here in the HTML put in a div. I'm going to give it the ID of holder, sort of like I did previously. And then maybe below that I will put in a paragraph. And the paragraph I'm going to give it the ID of description. So basically what the idea is here is that when I actually display the image, I want to put the title of the image inside the H2s. I want to put the image itself here into the holder. And I want to put the description of the image here inside this paragraph. So back up here in the head section again, let me drop in some more script tags and go about doing that. Now, the very first thing that I'm actually going to need to do is I'm going to need to parse out the, uh, the uh, URL parameter. I'm going to need to break down the query string so that I can find out the actual name of the image that I'm supposed to display. Again, uh, I could go ahead and do this right here. As a matter of fact, let me just do that. Let me just go ahead and do that right here. Uh, let's start off then by getting rid of the uh, question mark off the front of the query string. So I'm going to make a variable. I'm going to call it QS. I'm then going to do uh, document.location.search, which is where the query string is stored, dot substring. I'm going to tell it to take from the first character to document.location.search.length. So basically take everything from the first character, which actually is the second, leaving off the question mark, all the way to the end, leaving me with query string then. Then I want to take QS and I want to break it down. So I'm going to make another variable. I'm going to call it pair. This probably looks pretty familiar from you, for you uh, from this last example that we've done. Uh, from this, I'm going to do uh, QS and I want to split it based on the equal sign. Uh, just as a, uh, an aside, uh, here we're doing almost essentially the exact same thing we did in the previous example, which should definitely be a good clue to you that this is some reusable code that we should probably put into another external file and just be able to import whenever we need it. But I think we'll take care of uh, something along those lines here in another example probably. Um, so anyway, that should split it up. Uh, the last thing I need then is, well, that might actually be it. If I actually put in an alert and I look at, take a look at the value of pair element one, what we should get is just the name of the image. And sure enough, there it is. So that's the crucial piece of information that this script really needs. So what I'm going to do next then is a window.onload function. There we go. So we already have that piece of information retrieved. Once it's retrieved, then what we want to do is we want to uh, uh, actually start taking the information for that particular image and putting it into our um, uh, different holders, our different HTML tags down here. Something else just occurred to me though, and that's that we have all the information about these different images, and here we have the image name, but we don't really have an easy way to be able to pull out a particular image's information based simply on its name. So maybe what I'll do is over here in my, uh, my photos.js file, maybe I'll create myself just a little standalone function over here. I'll call it uh, getImage. And I'll say that what I'm actually going to do here is I'm going to pass the image's name to this function. And then what I want this function to do is to go through the legwork of sorting through this array, finding the image that has that name, and then returning it to me. So here I'm going to put in another for loop uh, for variable x equal to 0, while x is less than photos.length, x++. plus plus. So we're essentially just going through the array. Uh, for each one of the elements in that array, I'm going to say if that particular um, element of the array, photos element x, if its name is equal to the name that was passed to this function, then let's return that particular image, photos element x. Right? If uh, we get all the way through this and we never return anything, keeping in mind, of course, that when we call return here, that will mean the end of the for loop and the end of the function. It'll return the image and the rest of this function will just stop. But if we should happen to get all the way through the rest of that for loop without ever returning the image, basically meaning that we passed it a name that doesn't exist, then what I'm going to do is I'm just going to return null, which will be the indicator that we couldn't find an image of that particular name. Now where that image, or where that uh, function, get image, yeah, get image I called it, where that will actually come in handy is over here what I can do is I can just call uh, 
that function get image and give it the name of the image that I want to display on the page this particular time which is stored in pair element one so we should end up either then with an image object uh, from our external JavaScript file stored here inside the image variable or we'll end up with null so I could do something like say uh, I could just say something like if image because if it was null that would be false so this if statement wouldn't run so what I could do is then just um, at this point go through and start putting in the correct information so I could do something like say var title uh, let's say var title tag equals uh, document dot get element by ID title so I'm basically retrieving those h2 tags uh, I'm gonna do uh, actually let me do a little copying and pasting here to speed that up three different things I want to retrieve I want to retrieve the title tag I want to retrieve the holder tag and I want to retrieve the description tag there we go so those are the three different tags that I need to fill then I just need to create some text nodes and an image tag to actually put into them so let me say var title equals uh, document dot actually I think I could shorten that down a little bit if I say title tag dot append child and what I want to append is a document dot create text node right? and the actual text that I want to put into that text node is going to come from the image object that we retrieved with our get image function and the name of the text the name of the attribute inside that object is title so there we go I'm gonna to want to do almost the exact same thing for the description tag so let me do a little copying and pasting again there we go all right, and then the image itself is just slightly more complicated because I have to actually create the image uh, tag itself. Let me call it image tag document dot create element img creating an image tag. For that image tag, I need to set its source attribute to images slash to get into the correct subfolder. Right. The actual image's name then comes from the image object and the attribute is called name and I just need to append the extension onto the end of it. Then to my image holder, which is called holder tag, I'm just going to append child. I've lost the ability to type here. And I want to append my image tag. There, something like that. Let's see if it works. Eh, never does the first time. It's what the development tools are for. Error console, can't find variable photo. Boy, that sounds familiar. Didn't I just make that mistake? Line 13. Line 13, right up here. Hmm. Oh, wrong file. The error is in photos.js, line 13. So right here, photos. Let's give that another try. Hey, there we go. All right, so there's the title of our image, the actual image itself, and then our description down below it. Let me go back to my view page and just add one more quick little thing in there, a backlink. Uh, let's just uh, throw in a paragraph here. And inside the paragraph, let me put in a quick hyperlink. Uh, say back to index and here I want to go to photo gallery index.html there we go all right so there's my first picture back to index click on this one you see it based on the URL uh, the URL parameter it retrieved the correct image and its uh, title and description same thing here maybe the pedestrian bridge there it is. Everything looks like it's working great. So like I said at the beginning, what we've basically done here is taken something that an HTML could have taken us, uh, I don't know, I guess you could almost say an infinite number of HTML pages, and we've set ourselves up so that with JavaScript we can do the entire thing with just two pages and a little bit of creative code. So a uh, fun little example, just the kind of thing that these URL parameters are fantastic for.
Now, as I pointed out in the last couple examples, when we were actually having to parse our query string, there was a lot of code that we basically repeated from one example to another, so it would be a pretty good idea for us to actually take that code and separate it from the example so that it would be something that we could actually reuse in future examples and in projects that we might happen to need. Um, one other thing about those last couple examples though was that of course they were both very simple. They both had one URL parameter being passed to a page and all we really needed was the value of that one parameter. In a more realistic setting we might have potentially multiple URL parameters that make up a query string being passed to a page. And we might, need, we might need to be able to find out what parameters are there, which ones aren't. We might need to be able to pull out particular parameters based on their name, and a number of other different uh, varieties of situations. So what we really need is we need sort of an external parser, uh, a, a little bit of script that we could import into our uh, pages whenever we happen to need to deal with URL parameter parsing so that we don't actually have to uh, go through and keep writing that code again over and over and over again. So what I've done here is I've started a new file called a query string parser.js. This is going to be an external JavaScript file and it's basically going to contain code that would be needed any time that we would uh, have to deal with query strings. So I'm going to start off the file here just with a little comment. Uh, query string parser uh, import whenever query strings need to be parsed. Well, that probably isn't the best uh, thought out comment I've ever made, but anyway. Um, since query strings and URL parameters themselves are actually made up of different parts, the URL parameters specifically, for example, are made up of a name and a value. I, generally when I do this, I think the best way to handle that is to actually store those two values, the name and the value, in an object. So what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to create a uh, constructor function. I'm going to call it a parameter. And I'm going to set up this constructor function so that it will be passed a name, which I'll just call n, and a value, which I'll call v. And then all I'm going to have it do is take the value for n and store it in a name attribute inside the object that's created. And I'm going to have it take the value of v and store it inside a value attribute that will be created. So when we get down to the point in actually parsing our query string that we actually need to save the individual parts of the parameters themselves, we'll be able to use this constructor to create objects to store those values. I'm also then going to need a, uh, an array so that if we have multiple URL parameters as part of a query string, we'll be able to store all of those different parameters together in a way that will be quick and easy for us to access. So I'm going to make a, an array. Uh, I'm going to call it parameters or parameters. I had an instructor once that always called them parameters, and that's for some reason what I always hear in my head. Uh, this is going to be an array and we don't at the moment know how big it is so I'm just going to kind of leave it open-ended so that I can uh, uh, put as many different parameters in there as I might happen to need. Once that's done I'm ready to at that point go through the, basically the process of um, uh, parsing down the uh, query string and um, uh, turning it into objects and storing it in the array. Now keep in mind that what our query string actually looks like is it'll start off with a question mark, it'll then have some name followed by some value, there may then be an ampersand followed by another name and another value, right? And that might continue for who knows how long. Uh, as pages get more complicated we could end up having lots and lots of different URL parameters passed as part of a query string to that page. But that's fundamentally what we're dealing with here. So just like we've done before, the first step I probably want to take is to go ahead and get rid of that question mark since it doesn't really serve any purpose. So I'm gonna, like I've done before, start off by creating a variable called QS, QS for query string. I'm going to get that value by doing document.location.search.substring and I'm going to pull everything out of the search property except for the first character. There we go. So that'll give us everything except the first character, everything except for the question mark. So basically at that point we've gotten rid of that question mark. The next thing I would need to do then is break them up into the individual parameters. So basically I want to separate something like name1 equals value1 one as one parameter from name2 equals value2 two as another parameter. So I'm going to make another variable. This one will actually end up holding an array. Uh, I will call it, um, let's see, what do I want to call it? I've already used the name parameter and parameters. 
uh, let's call it params. Uh, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take my query string QS and I'm going to split it and when I split it I'm going to split it on an ampersand. So if there's an ampersand present anywhere like there is right here what will happen is it will be removed and I will instead end up with my two parameters separated and stored in separate elements of the params array. Once that's done I can then go through that array uh, params Right, go through each element of that array and I want to take each one of the individual parameters like name one equals value one and I want to split it up. So I will start by doing uh, params element x uh, dot split and I want to split it on an equal sign this time. That's of course going to give me my pair those two separate values. And then what I want to do is I want to take that pair and I want to actually put it inside a parameter object using the constructor function up here. And then to take that object and put it here into my parameters array, which is where it'll be stored and then easily accessed from any other JavaScript code that we might need to access it from. So let me do uh, parameters, which is my array, dot push. I'm going to put into that array a new parameter object. The name of that parameter object is in pair element 0 and the value is in pair element 1. So that should do it. By the time that for loop is finished our parameters array should be full of uh, parameter objects. Each parameter object then will have the name and the value in it. So we still more or less have all the data that was in our parameter string before, our query string I should say, before, except now we've turned it into JavaScript objects inside a JavaScript array which will generally make it much much easier for us to work with and to access. The one other thing that I then want to add, uh, let me go ahead and get rid of this right here, it doesn't really need to be there. The one other thing that I really want to add then is I want to give myself a function that will simplify the retrieval of values based on names. So I'm going to make myself a function. I'm going to call it get parameter value for name. That's a long function name, but it's descriptive. And then what I'll do is I'll actually pass this function a name. So kind of the idea is here, I would pass this function something like name1, and then I would want it to go through my parameters array, find the parameter called name1, and give me back the value that went along with that particular parameter. So this is going to very much resemble that function we did for getting images in the last example. So for a variable x starting at 0 while x is less than parameters.length, so I'm going to go through the whole parameters array if necessary. What I want to do is I want to look for a parameter, parameters element x, where the name stored in the object in that parameter is equal to the name that was passed to this function. If we find a situation where that's true, where we find a parameter whose name is the same as the name that was passed to this function, then what I want to do is I want to return that particular parameter, that object. So I'll return that particular element to the parameters array. And just like before, if we get all the way through that for loop and we never return and stop this function, that basically means we never found a parameter by that name, what I'll do instead is I will return null, which will be our indication that, hey, we couldn't find a parameter with that name, it doesn't seem to exist. So I think that ought to about do it. It's not too much code really, even at my low resolution. It's only a page here. It's like 27 lines of code with some comments in there. So not too bad at all. But the nice thing is we should be able to use this thing all over the place and uh, hopefully have it work out to where we don't ever have to really mess by hand with uh, parsing down these query strings again. Okay, to test out our query string parser, what I thought we would do is actually take the testing of that and combine it with one other last subject. The last subject is one other place that query strings can actually come from, and that is from forms. Previously, all of the query strings that we've dealt with in these different examples have basically been query strings that we've, one way or another, uh, pseudo-manually added to a particular URL. But one place that query strings can actually kind of spring from automatically is from forms that have their methods set to get. 
You might remember that when we talked about query strings back at the beginning, I told you about how every time you click a URL or when you uh, type an address into an address bar, what you're actually doing is what's called a GET request. And that's the, exactly the same thing that a form will do here when we set its method to GET. Essentially what will happen is a form that has its method set to GET will take all of the different fields that are present inside that form, will turn them all into URL parameters, combine them all together into a query string, and then we'll take that and actually send send it to whatever the action is. So here what I have is I have this form set up to pass my query strings to a uh, page called uh, parameters from form submit. My actual form here okay, looks just like this and when I actually then fill in the details of this form, if I put in a, a name here, uh, Victrola Firecracker, Right? and submit it, you can see that it submits over to the page uh, that was set as its action value, the page called parameters from form submit.html. But if you take a look at what else it did, it also took each one of those field names, first name and last name you can see there, along with the values that I actually typed into the form, and it turned those all into a query string and submitted them to that page. So uh, forms are basically a place where uh, query strings can uh, sort of be created automatically by the browser and that kind of thing can sometimes come in handy knowing that they're able to do that. So um, with that little detail aside, the fact that uh, query strings can come from forms that have their methods set to get, let's test out our uh, query string parser, uh, here it is right here, and uh, see if we can actually have it show the different parameters, the first name and the last name that we retrieved. So on the show parameters page, the page where those values are submitted to, what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to import, oops, import my uh, uh, query string parser, that external file we just made, query string parser.js, there we go. And uh, that should be pretty much all we really need to do then. Now, I'm actually going to violate down here in the body our unobtrusive JavaScript rule. I'm going to go ahead and put some JavaScript down here in the body just to keep this example simple. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to do document.writeline and I'm going to do get parameter value for name first name. All right. Basically what the idea is here, this get parameter value for name function is the function that we wrote over here in our query string parser, get parameter value for name. So uh, more or less what happens is when this uh, parameters from forms submit page is uh, first uh, brought up by the browser, it will execute all of the, the code that we have in our query string parser external file, which means that it'll actually go through and do all this work where it actually goes through and parses out the query string that it receives. After it's done all that, okay, it'll get down here to the body where we then call get parameter value for name, right? in which case it will call the function we have here. We pass it first name as the name. It'll then go through the array of different parameters that it's built, try and find the one called first name and give us its value back. Ooh, and I actually just uh, spotted an error in there. That should be dot value right there. Glad I noticed that or that wouldn't have worked very well. Right? So let's go ahead and pull that up in the browser and see if it works. Sure enough, Victrola. Right? If I do uh, essentially the same thing again, put a break in there, and this time instead of telling it to get the first name, I tell it to get the last name. There we go, Firecracker. So it's really just kind of that easy now. With our query string parser written, whenever we need to deal with query strings, all we'll have to do at this point is do an import uh, for our external file like we've done here and then we just get our parameter values like we're doing down here. So it really ought to simplify things quite a bit. Uh, for a little fun for yourself, you might want to go back to some of those previous examples we wrote and try using the query string parser to do the same work that we were doing before. What it'll uh, end up doing is letting you eliminate a lot of code from those two examples. So um, uh, this should be a pretty worthwhile little script that we could keep around and make quite